the music. Good morning. My name is Mike Silberg, and the title of this talk is God has saved the best generation for last. But I wanted to point out, these were given to me by a real special couple. I'm not going to say their name, but God has blessed them greatly. And I just wanted to mention that. Um, or else I have this prop here. It's a bottle of wine. We're going to start with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for giving us the best and saving the best for last. And we ask your touch on this talk. In Jesus' name we pray. You know, in the year 1517, a monk named Martin Luther nailed 95 theses or doctrinal statements on a church door in Wittenberg, Germany. In so doing, it triggered off the Protestant Reformation. At the same time, the high renaissance of Italy was beginning to emerge. The Bible says God has called forth the generations from the beginning. Each generation accomplishes a specific purpose of God. The Renaissance, Renaissance and the Reformation together were a huge, explosive, spiritual event. Everything had been leading up to this. Now, before this came about, this is what the world looked like. Most people were illiterate. They did not know how to read. The production and printing of books and their distribution was still very primitive, so making books was prohibitively expensive. There were very few Bibles in existence at that time, and they were mostly written in Latin, which was not the common language of the people. Only priests used a small number of Bibles available, and only the wealthy and nobility had access to what few books there were. In fact, in university libraries, there was a limited number of books. Uh, Cambridge, which is one of the leading universities of the world, in their library, they had only 124 books. Today, it's not uncommon to walk in anybody's house and they might have 124 books. So it's very difficult for us to envision what it was like before the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation. It was tough for us to imagine what that was like. In 1440, a very significant technological development took place. Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press in Mainz, Germany. The printing press made it possible to copy and distribute information with much greater speed and much greater volume, which, you know, with far less cost. Because of this, the Reformation and the Renaissance of Italy soon spread across Europe and changed the world. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Christopher Columbus, all lived in Italy during this time. The demand for education and literacy for all people began to rise up everywhere. Schools and universities for the common people began to open up. Bibles were translated into the language of everyday people. The Bible says God has called forth the generations from the beginning. God brought all these things together at just the right time to bring forth the spiritual and cultural explosion of the Renaissance and the Reformation. In the early 1960s, a similar event in terms of its impact, you know, to Luther nailing the 95 Theses, theses took place in America on February 7th, 1964. Not long after JFK's assassination, the Beatles landed in New York City without meaning to, they triggered off a spiritual and cultural revolution in the U.S., and at the same time, there was a science and technological revolution. All at the same time, we put a man on the moon, we stopped the Vietnam War, the charismatic movement impacted America and the Christian community. It was a mini 
Renaissance and Reformation. When the 1970s came along, I read a word from the Lord someone had had, and this is what they said. The initial impact of the 60s is over. The Holy Spirit has removed himself to allow the spirit of the Antichrist to come forth. This word has proved to be true. Those of us who were involved in the wonderful move of the Holy Spirit back in the 60s and 70s saw the freshness of what God was doing begin to grow stale and cold in the 1980s. And what is here today is a far cry from what we had back then. But God is always growing and increasing, even still. Out of the original Renaissance and Reformation of the 15 and 1600s came a new world where the common people had access to education and economic opportunities. So too, God is working behind the scenes today and has brought forth a new spurt of spiritual growth from the 1960s. You know, 10 years ago, I was at this convention of believers from all over the world in Israel. There were hundreds of people from China, Malaysia, Africa, and even from Muslim and uh, Arab countries. Many of these believers were from what is called the 1040 window. Those are Asian and African nations in between the northern latitudes of 10 and 40. Historically, this area has not been open to receiving the gospel. Most of the people I work with at this convention were from this area. One man, he was a Palestinian man, originally his name was Jihad, but he changed his name after he became a believer. I work with another na man named Ali. He's an Arab believer in Jesus from Silwan, a suburb in Jerusalem. The largest group at this convention were hundreds of believers from China. Isn't that amazing? The Bible says God has called forth the generations from the beginning. We are in the middle of a huge, ever-increasing spiritual explosion. Now I'm going to share with you the story of the wedding of Cana from John 2. It starts like this. There was a wedding in Cana, and Jesus and his mother's disciples were invited to the wedding. You know, I want to stop here for a second, get a picture of what is happening. You know, obviously, a wedding is a major event, but back then, even more so. They didn't have massive opportunities for entertainment like we do. They didn't have TVs, they didn't have the internet, didn't have printing presses or the Beatles. When someone got married, it was a big deal, a very big deal. So big that weddings were a huge production. They didn't last for just an afternoon or for just an evening like us, but they lasted for days, sometimes as long as a week or more. So we're going to return to the story with Jesus and his disciples at this wedding. We're going to use our imagination a little bit, try to imagine how this played out. Okay, so the wedding party is in full swing. Jesus' mother runs into someone from the family of the newly married couple who says, Mary... Guess what? Uncle Zachariah didn't order enough wine. Can you believe it? We're already running out. Now think about this. This was a typical Middle Eastern wedding, which it probably was. This wedding was going to last for a couple of days, maybe <laughs> as long as a week. So running out of wine is not a good thing. This is an embarrassment. Many friends and relatives have traveled a long way to get here. A lot of planning has got, been involved. They don't want to be known as the family that runs out of wine when they throw a wedding. So Mary's thinking to herself, man, this is going to be a disaster. What are we going to do? And she realizes, oh my gosh, Jesus is here. He can do something. Jesus can fix this. So Jesus goes over to, so Mary goes over to Jesus, and she says, they have no wine, which means in a language only a mother can speak. Jesus, they have no wine. Do something. Yeah. So let's stop again. According to John 2, verse 11, the last verse of this little story, it says Jesus had not done any miracles yet. This would be Jesus' first miracle. He hasn't done any. He had not healed anyone. He had not given any great sermons. He had not stopped a storm with a word or multiplied any loaves and fishes. As of this state, he's really done nothing miraculous in a public sense. All Mary knew was her son was here. 
the Son of God was here. He can do something. He can fix this. So Mary says to the servants, you know, you see Jesus over there, whatever he says you to, for you to do, do it. So Mary carried some weight at this wedding. She was one of the, the movers and shakers in this wedding. So these servants listened to her. And so uh, there was the six empty water pots of stone able to contain 20 or 30 gallons of water each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Now, that probably took a little while. These are <laughs> big pots. And he said to them, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it was from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have been drinking, then the inferior. But you have saved the best for last. The amount of water Jesus turned into wine was about 150 gallons. That's over 700 bottles of wine. More wine than they could ever know what to do with. The Bible says God has called forth the generations from the beginning. Just like God brought Gutenberg and the printing press at the right time to bring in the Renaissance and the Reformation, just like God used the Beatles to bring forth the Cultural Revolution and many Renaissance of the 1960s, so too God is setting the stage right now for Jesus to come to the rescue and bring in some wine, bring forth the final generation of this age. In the Bible, wine is an image of the Holy Spirit. If you look at the church today, it looks like we're running out of wine. We're running out of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit isn't moving like it was in the 1960s. But don't worry. The Son of God is here. He can do something. He will do something. He will fix this. Jesus is about to bring in more wine, more Holy Spirit than we know what to do with. The book of Joel says Jesus is going to pour out his Spirit on all flesh, and the mountains will drip with sweet wine. And God says in the book of Malachi, for from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name, for my name will be great among the nations. God's called forth the generations from the beginning, and he's saved the best wine for last. He's saved the best generation for last. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prince of life is there.